Good morning, everyone. Well, we just have a couple of announcements um, before we start, actually very few. Uh, they're in the, in the bulletin, of course, but altar flowers this morning are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Charles Barris from Shirley and Earl. Um, Bible study uh, this Tuesday in the evening by a Zoom at 6 p.m. continues, and next Sunday we'll be back here again for Sunday morning Bible study and worship. Also, I would like to uh, uh, welcome once again Pastor Wynn Grossclose uh, for filling the pulpit uh, for us while Brian is away. Uh, he's been, Pastor Wynn's been with us a couple of times, and we always appreciate your teaching and exposition. Thank you. And with that, um, let us begin our worship. And our call to worship this morning comes from the book of Romans, verses 33 to 36. Romans 11, 33 to 36. Here our call to worship. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you this morning with great thankfulness that we can do that. Bow and worship the creator of the universe and the savior of our souls. Father, please prepare our hearts now for worship, that we would worship you acceptably in spirit and in truth. For from you and through you and to you are all things. With thankfulness and joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, our opening hymn this morning is um, page 376, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. seated. Our New Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Romans chapter 10 and we'll be reading verses 10 or verses 14 through 17. 
And beloved, this is God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. But how are they to call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed, and uh, they, they, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Our confession this morning is a scriptural one. It is historically one of the earliest confessions that was held and confessed by the church. Uh, we oftentimes talk about the Nicene Creed, which comes from the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Prior to the formulation of some of these creeds, there were, there were creeds that were being developed by the church, many of which were based on passages of scriptures. But a lot of scholars would argue that this, this is the core and the beginning within the Christian church of, of the creeds that would, would be held by the church throughout the ages. And so I would ask that you would join with me, as it's written in your, in your bulletin, in confession, confessing this creed as recorded to us in 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the spirit of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Amen. Let us go to the word and to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you for your church. We thank you for each saint that is here and we thank you for the saints that would desire to be here but who are unable to be here. We pray that you would certainly keep Pastor Brian safe in his travels and bring him home safely as well that he would continue ministering here within this body. And I pray that your, your word would go out. For without one being sent to preach, without one taking the gospel to his neighbors, to his co-workers, to the people that they meet, uh, to the far ends of the earth, how are they to know? And how are they to believe? We come here, not because of ourselves, we come here not because of, of anything that we've done or of habits that we have formed, good, bad, or otherwise. We come here because we seek to worship you and to honor you in all that we are. Father, I pray that you would do that in us. And Father, one of the things that we struggle with is sin. And we have been a sinful people. Rather than doing things as you would lay it out in your word, we have oftentimes chosen our own way. And so, Father, we pray that you would forgive us, that you would forgive us of the things that we have chosen to do that we know we ought not have done, that you would forgive us of the things that we ought to have done, but we chose not to do. We pray that you would forgive us for where we have been weak-kneed and have not shared the gospel with those people or not took, taken a stand for your name with those people that we engage with. We ask that you would forgive us not only of the works of our hands, but of the times where our minds have been allowed to wander into areas that do not please you. We, thank, we pray that you would forgive us of those times where the, the motivations and the passions of our hearts have strayed from pursuing your way. We fall short of your glory. And Father, if we were relying upon our own works, we know that we would be utterly lost. But we are not relying upon our works. We come to you trusting in the completed work of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And so Father, forgive us not because of who we are, 
but we pray that you forgive us because of whose we are and that you would stand us rightly on a platform in your presence, in your throne room, as we seek to gather and worship you because of Christ's work. We also pray, Father, that you would turn our hearts away from wicked things, that we would love nothing but what you love, that we would hold to nothing but what your Bible teaches, and that we would indeed be spent in our lives, even sharing the gospel, building your kingdom for your glory. We pray for those in this church that are suffering and those who are hurting, those who are sick, those who are grieving. We pray that you'd be merciful to them. We pray that you would show them hope in the midst of their darkness, that you would give them life in the midst of their, sin, their pain, and that you would give them renewed life. We know that in all things, that if we are yours, that we have a, a new life to come when we pass away in this life. But Father, there are many that we're not ready to quite let go of yet. We pray that if it be your will, that you would indeed heal them. I pray, Father, for this community and uh, the witness of Christ in this community. We pray that this community would turn away from wicked ways and, and turn towards you and would love you and that you would bring revival to this place and that you would start that revival here. And may your saints here be that tool to bring about your ends. We pray for those who govern over us on every level, uh, both locally in the states and in the national government and who make rules that affect us globally. I pray that those who love you, that you would strengthen, that they would make rules and laws that would honor you. We pray that those who do not love you and who are angry uh, about your word, that they would be brought to their knees, either in repentance or in destruction. We pray that either through them or in spite of them, uh, that we be given a context where we can live peaceful, quiet, godly, and holy lives before you, that we might worship freely. We pray for our brothers and sisters across the globe that are suffering, whether it be persecution or whether it be just the, the evils that come along with warfare. May you comfort them. May you guide them. And may you use them as tools to share the gospel there as well. In all things, Father, we pray that Christ is, is magnified, that he is glorified in our lives and throughout the earth. We pray for that day when he will come and make all things new, but until that time, equip us that we might change those things that dishonor you into things that honor you. Our lives are yours. Never let us forget that. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning will be on page 84, My Faith Looks Up to Thee.
Please be seated. Our scripture text this morning is taken from Psalm 29. Beloved, once again, this is God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Psalm 29. This is a psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shares or shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth. He strips the forest bare, and in his temple all cry glory. The Lord is enthroned over the flood, the Lord sits enthroned as a king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Would you pray with me once again? Heavenly Father, I pray that as we go to your word this morning, that you would be glorified in it, that we would see Christ in it, and that you would work through the words of my lips may not be about me, but may you work through me or in spite of me. Father, I pray that you are praised, that you are honored, that you are proclaimed this day in our lives, and that as your word resonates with our souls, I pray that we would be directed to live lives that honor you all the more because of what you reveal constantly in your word. May you do this in us, not just today, but every day. In our Bible studies, that our, that our personal studies, that every church service, we would walk away loving you more and desiring to honor you better because of what you have revealed to us here in your word. We praise you, Father. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So why do you go to church on Sundays? You might be surprised, but even as a pastor, that's a question that I get with some degree of regularity. Maybe it's a question that you get as well. And there's a lot of answers that people sometimes give when they get asked, why do you go to church on Sunday? For some people, if they are honest, their answer is something like, well, it's what I've always done. I've always gone to church on Sunday. It's how I was raised. My mom and dad did it with me, and so I did it with my kids, and I just don't know any other way. Or, well, I kind of like the people that show up there. They're, they're kind and gentle, and I enjoy their company. And while that is true, and not entirely bad reasons, I think all of us would agree, I think it's safe to say that all of us would agree that if that's where your argument stops, that it's a pretty weak argument uh, for why you go to church. Because the reality is, you can get fellowship in a lot of places. You might find that in the Kiwanis Club or the Boy Scouts, and you might find that at the local bingo hall and enjoy their company, and all of those kinds of things that go with it. And because it's what I've always done, well, that basically speaks about habit and not necessarily reason for what you do. 
Some simply say, well, I go to church to learn about God. And that's a better answer. But you can do that through a good book. You can do that through a podcast or a TV show. And those don't replace coming to church. Although more and more, I find a lot of people thinking that it does. Still better, some would argue, well, I do because God commands it. And that is true. God does command it. That we are not to forsake the assembly of the saints. It's Hebrews 10, 25. That's a better answer, but you know what? I think if all of us are honest, and I say us in the corporate sense, including this guy standing here, that there are things that are found in God's word that he tells us to do that we sometimes don't make a whole lot of effort to do, or we oftentimes say, oh, I'll just kind of avoid that, at least in that one. I'll do these things, and I'll work on those, because that's, that's really what I'm passionate about working on. It's those other things I'm a little bit uncomfortable with. And so I think a better answer, if not the right answer, you've got to be careful with that there, is that we gather in worship, we gather together on Sunday to engage in public worship. And I don't just simply say worship, because you should be doing that all week in your private life, in your family life, and things along those lines. But public worship, that it's public in the sense that there's nothing secret about what you're doing. You're gathered together as part of your allegiance to Christ in this eternal struggle for the minds and the souls and the hearts of the people of this world. To publicly worship God, to honor God. But maybe we need to clarify the question even more and ask the question, what does public worship mean? We know what public is, but what does public worship refer to? The English word worship literally means to express a reverence and adoration for a deity. Uh, interestingly, if you go to the Greek and the Hebrew Old and New Testament, one of the most common words that is translated as worship is the word to serve, which is, by the way, why we typically call this a worship service, right? We are serving God by honoring him, by adoring him, by giving glory to his name. It's what we were created to do, at least in part, and we were to enjoy that. But what then does right worship look like? Do we get to just make it up as we go along? Hey, I like this. You know, I saw the Hindus over there doing that. That looks kind of fun. Can we do that? And again, I think we have some clarification to make. I know you guys use the Westminster Shorter Catechism, so I thought the Westminster Confession's definition of True worship is probably about as, as straightforward and natural for, for this body as a place to go. Uh, if you go to chapter 21, section 5, if you kind of like to look things up, uh, that's where I'm finding this thing, right? Worship would include the reading of Scripture with godly fear. In other words, not just read it to read it, but read it with a sense of reverence for what it is that you've read. Sound preaching and Here's my favorite part, the conscionable hearing. In other words, you're paying attention, you understand it, and you're applying it to your conscience, your soul. In obedience to God with understanding, faith, and reverence, the singing of psalms, the right use of the sacraments, as well as occasional oaths, vows, fastings, etc. That's what we've gathered here to do. That's our goal, is to honor God with right worship, to glorify Him, but there's one more question that we need to ask, and this is where Psalm 29 comes into play. What is our motivation? What is our motivation to do just that? And I would suggest to you that the motivation for our worship is found in verse 2 of Psalm 29. Give glory to Yahweh that his name be given due, its due. That we're to worship Yahweh, adorned in holiness. That we're to worship God for who he is, but also for what he has done. 
And that should be our motivation, always and ever. It should be something that we, we cannot not do, not because it's a habit, but because we want to give God glory for who he is and what he has done in our life. It's verse 2, and that leads us to Psalm 29. Psalm 29 addresses worship, and in doing so, it breaks up this idea in three parts. I promise you, my, my wife is snickering at me because she, she knows that I hate doing three-point sermons, but sometimes the text just kind of lays it out that way, and I say, darn it, God, couldn't you give me a fourth point to use? Um, but nonetheless, we really have three parts of this psalm. Kind of an initial command to give God worship for who he is. That's verses 1 and 2. The voice of Yahweh speaking. That's verses 3 through 9. And then Yahweh reigning is found in verses 10 and 11, and the results thereof. So you can maybe even say more simply who God is and what God speaks and how God rules is what this psalm talks about. And so we begin with the first part of the psalm in the first two verses. It's a psalm of David. And I always, and you've heard me say this before, I always read those superscripts on top because they're part of the original Hebrew text. So they are part of the inspired word of God that is given to us. Um, so we should pay attention to those things and not just kind of gloss over them and go, okay, that's just some editors. No, it's not some editor. It's the original authors under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The psalm of David. Give to Yahweh, O sons of God, give to Yahweh glory and strength. Give to Yahweh glory that is due his name. Worship Yahweh in the adornment of holiness. Now, the first thing I want to point out is that those four verbs that are there, give, 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 and then worship, are all in the imperative tense. In other words, there's force that is given to them. These aren't suggestions. They aren't saying, well, you know, you might do this. Here are all of your options that you can choose from. No. An imperative says, you must do this. You will do this. They're commands of God. We must do these things. It's part of what we are called to do. It's not a matter of what we should do. It's a matter of what we are to do. Interestingly, this is just the geek in me. Uh, as a technical aside, the, the word that we translate as worship there, in the Hebrew grammar, the grammatical structure of this, kind of like technical things. This is kind of a technical thing, but I think it has some neat implications. Is, is in the stem that's known as the hishpatel, um, uh, hishtafel, excuse me. Um, it's a re relatively rare construction in Hebrew grammar, um, and it's almost always found in the context of worship. And it implies two things, and that's really what's of value, I think. First is it's causative. In other words, that God is the one causing us to worship. He is the one driving us to worship. If we're going to worship on our own, we're not going to worship right or well. We need God's Holy Spirit to be in us and worship if we're going to worship in spirit and truth. That's what th this is talking about. That's what, what was implied even in the grammar of this text. And the second part of that is it implies a matter of submission. Our worship is not about worshiping the way we want. It's about submitting to what God wants as we gather to worship. And as we talked in Sunday school, how oftentimes, especially going through the Old Testament, we find God saying, you will worship me in this way, in this way, in this way, in this way, being so very specific. And if you doubt that, find these guys by the name of Nadab and Abihu that tried to kind of invent a way of worship and see how God responded to them. That's how the language of the Old Testament works there. But that's, that's how this grammar, what this grammar implies to us, is that, that our worship is, is to be submissive to God. And I think that's a valuable thing to be reminded of. We are to submit. It's not about us, but it's about Jesus Christ. And we're to submit to him, and not just in worship. We're certainly to submit to him in worship. 
but we're to submit to him in all of life. If you want to live a life pleasing to God, you don't get to be like Frank Sinatra and do it my way. You do it Jesus' way. And the same applies to our worship as well. We are to do it Jesus' way. That's an aside. Back to the text. And so we should, we should, we know now we've got four commands here that we're to worship God. But the question that we should be asking, just to clarify, is to whom is this command being given? You know, heck, if it's given to that guy, I don't need to do it, right? Well, this is kind of one of those areas where our translations aren't as helpful as they could be. Um, the English standard that I read translates it as heavenly beings. Uh, if you're using the King James Version, uh, it translates it, O ye mighty ones. Uh, and the New American Standard says, sons of the mighty. And the, new NI the NIV um, uses the, the phrase mighty ones uh, in, in general. But literally, the Hebrew of the text says sons of God. And that's how I translated it. Um, I think, and I'm speculating for a second, that probably the reason that our translators translate it that, that way is because there's some debates over whether the sons of God, when it's used as a phrase in the Old Testament, is a reference to angels or whether it's a reference to human beings that are believers and followers. I would say that it's a reference to human beings. And certainly, David's not writing a psalm commanding the angels to sing. Kind of, that goes second nature for them. And certainly recognizing that at the end of this psalm, in verse 11, David says that God gives strength to his people. So we are the mighty ones. And not even men always feel like it, but we are the mighty ones in that sense. And so... The question is, who is it addressing? It's addressing the sons of God, which, if you are a born-again believer, applies to you. Paul writes in Galatians 3, verses 20 through, 24 through 26, So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus, here, here what comes next, you are all, what? Sons of God. How? Through faith. John records very much the same thing in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 6 and 7. He said to me, this is the, the, land, the, the one seated upon the throne, and he said to me, it is finished, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. To the one who conquers, he will have this as his heritage. I will be his God, and he will be, what? My son. That's our heritage as born again believers in Jesus Christ. If you are a born-again believer this morning, you are a son or daughter of God. That is your heritage. That's an eternal heritage. That's a term that belongs to you. And thus, the psalm is addressing you and commanding you to worship. So you give to Yahweh his glory, glory that is due to his name, Worship him in the adornments of holiness. I want you to notice one more thing about these two verses together. They speak about a God who is glorious, and they speak about a God who is powerful, a God who is worthy of worship and holy fear, set apart. But notice that there is nothing overly casual about this language. I fear that one of the failures of this generation has been our tendency to speak to God with a very familial tone. In some ways, it's a polar extreme of a generation that's gone before us that spoke about God in such lofty words and it almost seemed like they were putting on a performance and not having a conversation with their Heavenly Father. But we need to find the sweet middle in between. It holds up the reverence of God in a mighty and a glorious way. 
but does not neglect that you are having an intimate conversation with your God as Father. And they can preserve both things together in tension. And we follow the counsel of the psalm, and we do not lose the grandiose reverence that we are to have is due to his name. When we come before him, let us not come before him being inclined to say, hey, Pop, what's up? You chuckle, but I've heard pastors begin prayers like that. That's not a good model for us to follow. And they were more inclined to use the language of the Apostle Thomas, who when he becomes convinced of the resurrected Christ, his first response is to refer to Jesus as my Lord and my God. That's powerful language. It's reverent language. And we are to be so adorned in holiness. Holiness simply means to be set apart for God and his purposes alone. Okay, so the holy things in the Old Testament were only to be used for God's worship and glory. And we are called holy in the Old Testament. And the New Testament, too, we are said to be holy as God is holy. And so we are to be adorned in that reality that we're to be set apart for worship and for honoring God. And as we move from that into verses 3 through 9, we find a a phrase that is repeated seven times. The voice of Yahweh. The voice of Yahweh is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. Yahweh is over the waters. The voice of Yahweh is strong. The voice of Yahweh is majestic. The voice of Yahweh breaks cedars. Yahweh breaks the cedars of Lebanon. It makes Lebanon dance. Some of your Bibles will say skip like a young bull. And Syrian like the calf of a wild bull. The voice of Yahweh cleaves with flames of fire. The voice of Yahweh writhes the wilderness. Yahweh writhes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of Yahweh writhes the fallow dove and gives early honeycomb. And in his temple, all of his say glory. Now, it's important to spend a little bit of time on packaging because there's a lot of figurative language that is, that is, that is used here. Um, and if you're following along in different translations of your Bible, you may say, uh, Pastor Wynn, some of what I have written in front of me doesn't line up exactly with how you have just translated it. And that's true because some of this section is notoriously difficult to translate. And that just is not me saying of my weakness, though I'm weak. That's reflected in the fact that when you pull out 10 different translations of the Bible, you're going to find pretty much 10 different wordings in, in sections here. Um, and that's because scholars are looking at terms and phrases that are maybe used just once in the Bible and going, ah, what does this mean? Or how is this to be understood and things along those lines? Uh, nevertheless, I think understanding the text uh, helps us to understand the purpose behind what David is getting at and what God is doing in this world of his. First, let me say, though, that this phrase that's repeated over and over again, this voice of Yahweh, is an extremely important phrase in Scripture. You're sitting there going, duh. Of course, I, I figured that one out. It shows up 40 time, 47 times in, in the Bible. Uh, Deuteronomy 28.2, there are blessings upon those who diligently listen. I love the diligently part. Who basically really listen closely and then, then apply it and pay attention to it, obey it. There's blessings for God's people when they do that. And curses of God upon those who neglect and ignore the word of God, the voice of God when he speaks. By the voice of the Lord, creation came to pass. And John also reminds us that it is Christ who is the voice of the Lord, the word of God taking on flesh. Ultimately, Jesus is the voice of the Lord. All of this language is not just simply saying God is rumbling here. He is. It's pointing us to Christ. 
It's helping us to see Jesus in, in the text here as we look forward. And if we're looking at it too, we recognize within this text, we see Jesus not only being the creator in the physical world, but he's also the creator in the spiritual realm of things and the recreator in the spiritual realm. Faith comes by hearing, we read earlier, and hearing by what? The word of Christ. And so saving faith is impossible for those who are apart from the word. The word is essential for people to be saved, which is why we send people all over the world with the gospel to preach to those. It has formative power and it has transformative power. It has creative power and it has regenerative power. That is the power of God unto salvation. That is the power of the gospel that David is speaking about here. So how does David flesh this out? This talking about Jesus, anticipating Jesus. How does he flesh this out within the text? The voice of the word, of the word is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. You know, Yahweh over the water. His voice is big, it is bold, it is powerful. And so too is the gospel. The gospel is not subtle. The, the Bible's teachings upon salvation are not subtle. They're plain and to be understood by all who read them. But also think about how the, the, the Bible describes the coming in the presence of God. Behold, the glory of God of Israel was coming from the east. This is Ezekiel. And the sound of his coming was like what? Like many waters. And the earth shone with his glory. Similarly, John in Revelation speaks of the Lamb. Uh, and, and he says, I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and the sounds like thunder. Ever been at the base of a waterfall? How loud and full that sound is. It almost vibrates you. That's the idea here. Many waters, great waters. The sound of thunder. Have you ever been like, right under where a thunder crack takes place. I mean, it, it can drop you to your knees as it shakes you. The question is, does the word of God, as you pick up your Bibles and read, does that do that to you? Does it shake you? Does it, does it drive you to your knees, both in repentance and in awe for what God has done? And I know we love the still small voice language of, of, of the prophet Elijah when he's in the cave, the hollow of the rock. But almost all of the time we find in scripture God speaking, it's big and bold and loud and rumbling. Do we do, we do that? Does the God of creation, when we, we have his words, make us tremble? Does it make us shake? Does it make us cry out glory at what he has done and who he is as he reveals himself in his word? The Lord thunders over the waters. His voice is louder even than the voice of many waterfalls. Verse 4, his voice is strong and is majestic. It is weighty. It has, as we would sometimes say, gravitas. It has weight to it. And we would do well to attend to its instruction. In verses 5 through 8, though, we find some, some very figurative language here that talks about geographic places. It talks about Lebanon and, and Mount Sirion, which is, by the way, another name for Hermon, Mount Hermon. We kind of see that in the, in the, in the New Testament. It's probably the place where Jesus was transfigured. Um, we talked about Kadesh. All of these areas are north of Israel um, and, and in pagan territory. And God is making even the pagan world skip and dance, but he is also making them writhe in pain. Some of our Bibles will say shake, but the, word, the Hebrew word there refers to a woman giving birth and going through the pains of childbirth. I don't think shake 
carries the weight, writhe is probably a better, better term to, to use there. But God is doing that, even in the pagan world, is what David is getting at. He is shaking them. He's bringing them joy on one hand, but he is shaking them to bits on another hand. Perhaps even in verse 7, we find this idea kind of summarized. The voice of God, and I want to use, my translation comes closer to the King James here. Um, cleaves, the King James says, divides with flames of fire. Now, that's a neat verse for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons I think it's neat is when you get to the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews uses this verse twice to help us understand the work of God. The first in Hebrews 12, 29, that our God is a consuming fire, that he uses fire to consume the dross, consume those things that are not his, to purify and refine his own people from the world, but also in 4.12. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. What does it do? It pierces to the division, the vision of the soul uh, and the spirit, joints and marrow, discerning thoughts and intentions of the heart. Folks, the word of God divides us when we really take it to heart. Because there's still, even in the redeemed, we still have that old man kind of pulling us in the direction of the world. And the word of God comes in there and says, no, I'm going to separate that. I'm going to cut that out like a surgeon's scalpel. I'm just going to cut straight through and divide that through. It divides families. Mothers and daughters and fathers and sons and uncles and aunts. And, and that's Jesus' words, not mine. He said, I come to bring a sword, not peace, because the gospel will divide families. It divides nations, and it divides individuals to the core. And God makes even the nations dance in celebration, but also suffer in agony as he divides things out. He is sovereign over the affairs, not only of his covenant people, but of the wicked as well. And he is sovereign over those even who will constitute his covenant people. Paul writes that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The solution of all of Americans, America's woes will not be found in the polling booths. It will be found with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Till lives are changed, till hearts are transformed, until there is renewal and revival that comes, we will continue down this path towards immorality and sin. If American falls, uh, if America falls, remember that this too will be the work of God in his raising up and bringing down, in his causing things to writhe in pain. Verse 9 speaks of travail, the writhing of the deer giving birth. Now, I want to highlight that, though, because there's a neat analogy that is found in that idea. You see, giving birth is a painful experience. I can't testify that personally, but I can testify to having witnessed that. But you know what? After all of the pain... After all of the suffering, there is new life. There's something that beautiful that, that is the result. God is doing that. This is what David is getting at in this world around him. Yes, he's causing the nations to rise up and topple down, but even in their toppling, the result is the redemption of people. You know, think about what happened after Pentecost and the gospel went out. Certainly persecution, certainly a lot of awful things, certainly a lot of suffering, but there were people who were redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, who became born again believers and given a life eternal. The gospel has risen up, built up nations, and it has torn them to the ground, and it will continue to do so across the ages. In addition, individuals. You see, because repenting of sin, if we really do it and we're serious about it, and we kind of 
couple that with what we sometimes talk about a, a, a godly um, uh, grief or godly sorrow over our sin, if we really are there, then guess what? That's a painful thing. But again, the result of that is new life, or at least renewed life uh, for the believer who has backslidden and, and stumbled into sin and is coming back and walking faith. And when we realize that God's plan is structured that way, and that he even uses suffering and pain to bring about new life, just as the pain of childbirth brings about new life, then those who are in his temple the only thing we can say when we really get that is glory. Glory for what he has done. And so we conclude this morning with this, the final verses of God's sovereign reign. Yahweh sits enthroned over the flood. That's, that's creational language. Um, that's a language of God separating the waters above and the waters below with the firmament, same kind of language, verbiage that is, that is used there. And God rules over all of it. God, God rules over creation. He's the guy that did it. It's a work of his glory. Yahweh sits enthroned as king forever. You realize that in the church in particular, we, we, we don't have a democracy. We have you know, a divine reign of a king who is Christ reigning over his church. And that we are to be in obedience to our king, but that applies even to this world. We know it though, and the world doesn't. And so part of our job is to let the world as ambassadors know who their king is and how to, to seek out his honor and his glory. Yahweh gives strength to his people because we need that. We need that desperately. And he blesses his people with peace. Because even though sometimes our world is a mess, there's something that we refer to in Christian circles called the peace that just passes all of our understanding. God brings that to us. That's the blessing that David is speaking about here. Yet look at David's life. He had a bumpy, bumpy ride. You know, he, his son was out to kill him, amongst other things. I mean, he had a bumpy ride, but he still spoke about peace and God giving peace to his people. He's not necessarily talking about a cessation of war. He's talking about the cessation of, of, of the sense of dread that we might live under because nothing in the world is kind of going our way. And thus, all we can say as his people is glory. God will continue working on the dividing. He will separate until the last of his elect come to faith and are redeemed and the final martyr is killed. And then at such a time, with the shout of an archangel, Jesus shall return. And once again, we will say glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for how this word instructs us. We thank you for the gospel by which uh, we may be saved, which is your power uh, unto salvation. We thank you that you are moving in this world and that you are tearing things down, but even in the midst of destruction, you raise up and you give new life. And so may we look for the, the fawn of the deer and see and recognize uh, that you are, you are working in the lives of people around us and in our own lives. All these things we pray, and we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 69. This is essentially what we are called to do, what the psalmist is calling us to do, is to stand upon the promises of God. It's all we can do in this life. Let's stand.
And now may God bless you and may he keep you. May he make his face to shine as a light upon you and may he be gracious to you. May he turn his countenance in your direction that means his affections and may he grant you shalom. Peace.